Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's uh, segment of the Lung Cancer Living Room, our uh, breaking news, if you will, um, story that we're bringing to you today is about the uh, epidemiology of young lung cancer study that um, our medical institute, the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute, um, is currently running. We're very excited to have with us today uh, Dr. Jorge Nieva, um, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Keck Hospital of uh, USC, Norris Cancer Hospital, and Barbara Gitlitz, who um, has been uh, a, played a role in the living room um, multiple times over the years. So welcome back to Dr. Gitlitz, who is Medical Director of Product Development at Genentech and Adjunct Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine in a voluntary position um, also at USC with Dr. Nieva. And then, of course, we have Stephen Huff, who is also no stranger um, to being a guest here at the Lung Cancer Living Room, who is an advocate and survivor. So welcome to all of you. For those of you um, who may not know me or are not familiar with the Lung Cancer Living Room, I'm Danielle Hicks. I'm Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Um, and I'm really excited to bring um, this meeting to all of you today and every time we bring it. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, before we jump into the program, we have a lot to cover today. Um, I will ask our speakers if they wouldn't mind, and Dr. Nieva, we'll start with you, to tell us a little bit about who you are and why you chose um, lung cancer um, as your area of specialty. Thank you so much, Danielle, and thanks so much for the opportunity to participate today. So my name is Jorge Nieva. I'm an oncologist at the University of Southern California. And I got into lung cancer early in my training. It must have been um, around the year 2001, 2002, when I was doing my fellowship and noticed that there was, you know, lots of work, lots of attention being played to um, breast cancer and a number of other cancers. But I had so many patients with lung cancer um, and it was such a terrible disease and we had so little understanding of it. And so few good medications that I said, you know, this, this is really where the need is. This is where we need to put in a research effort. And so when it came time to, you know, try to write research proposals, uh, I always focused on lung cancer early on and um, I've been doing it ever since. That's great. Thank you for joining us again. Dr. Gitlitz, how about you? Yeah, I think, um, Jorge and I are two peas in a pod. I had the same experience uh, in my training of, of seeing the research and development in other cancers and lung cancer seemed to be, you know, kind of an orphan and, and despite being such a killer of men and women, not much, not much change was being made in, in the treatments. So, you know, I felt it was just a, a, my career path, my crusade you know, to see if I can do something there. And, uh, you know, I had great mentors uh, that, that helped me along that pathway. And, you know, lo and behold, I don't think, you know, Jorge and I knew back then that, you know, in a, in a few short years, we'd be, lung cancer would be such an interesting, you know, disease with so much hope uh, with targeted therapies and immunotherapies. So, you know, I think we made the right choice, the right decision. And we're so, I'm just so happy to be here right now. And, um, uh, being in this time of great, great strides uh, and hope. Thank you so much. The lung cancer community is most definitely lucky to have both of you um, on the team. Uh, Steven, do you want to tell us a little bit um, about yourself? Give us a little bit of background on your story. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you so much for including me on this tremendous panel. It's really an honor to be here. And so uh, my name is Stephen Huff. I live in Franklin, Tennessee. I, I grew up in Tennessee. I played baseball at Austin P. and I'm currently a high school teacher here. So 
Um, I, I am here because I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer at the age of 29, just a few months before my wedding date. And with no family history, no exposure, and, uh, and not smoking myself being an athlete, uh, it was a shock. But I think just like many other lung cancer patients, I don't necessarily fit that criteria, uh, or at least what I thought was the criteria. But I can tell you that in our Nashville community or greater Nashville community, uh, I'm in the clinics quite a bit, and I, I see more and more patients just like myself, you know, young, healthy, et cetera. And so uh, I'm here today because I am the benefit of some great research and some breakthrough treatments that have kept me stable for almost four years. And so mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I hit my four year uh, cancerversary uh, in about a month. So it's, it's approaching fastly. Uh, but I, I am, I would love to, to share my story as it relates to um, the hope and the excitement around what we bring, especially to patients, my other patients that I've, I've met through other various programs. And because of this, you know, I can't emphasize how much uh, and how important cancer research is. So I'm so very blessed to be here. Thank you. We are absolutely thrilled to have you. And I think I met Stephen fairly shortly after um, you got married and after you were diagnosed out in Tennessee. We had a we had a great dinner um, um, with you and your beautiful wife. Um, what you didn't share was the exciting thing that has happened um, in those four years since diagnosis. I don't know if you want to just touch on that for a second. Yes, I would love to, Danielle. It's uh, part of why research is so important to me, especially you know, what we're going to talk about today is I have been gifted this this time and this duration with my family and friends. And with this time, my wife and I decided about two and a half years ago that we wanted to start a family of our own. Being newly married, being young, we said, what do we got to lose? So we did it. Um, we, we made the leap. We went to Nashville Fertility Clinic. Um, and we, we started a family. We welcomed our son on January 29th of 2020, right before COVID started. And so I joke with everyone that I have been on a year and a half of paternity leave uh, because I am teaching <laughs> from home, working remotely. So he is, he, he is the biggest blessing in my life today. So That's great. And he's absolutely adorable. If, if you don't already follow Stephen um, on social media, you can be sure to uh, see some some amazing, amazing family photos that, that come out of that. So welcome to all of you. Um, with that, I think we should jump right in. And before we get into talking about um, uh, epidemiology uh, and what that is, I want to step back a little bit and talk about young lung cancer and where um, this sort of research journey began, um, again, with um, the Adaria Lung Cancer Medical Institute. And Barbara, I know you were intimately involved back in the day when this started. So can you explain um, a little bit why the decision was made to study lung cancer in this younger subset of, of the population? Um, um, sure. Um, at the time, I was a faculty full-time at, at USC. I was attending uh, meetings with the, the, the group, the Adaria Lung Cancer Medical Institute. And, you know, it, it came to our awareness, uh, people like, like Stephen. I'm, there's um, this, this woman named Jill Costello, who uh, was a, a college student at UC Berkeley and an athlete, a never smoker. And you know, at 21 years of age, she was she was diagnosed with with metastatic lung cancer. Um, so you know this this tragedy and and this awareness, and then you know that one case, your your mind is open to that awareness, and then again, just like Stephen, all these other cases uh, were were flooding in of of you know young, mostly women at at that time, healthy athletes you know, never smokers and in, in the prime of their life, marathon runners, swimmers, uh, developing lung cancer. And this, you know, kind of gave a, a, a shout out to, uh, to something that needed to be done, that this population needed to be studied. And, you know, from retrospective single institution uh, looks at their data, we saw that that these patients tended to have enrichment for drivers of their cancer, what we call oncogenic drivers like EGFR and ALK and ROS1. 
So we felt that we needed to, to study these people. We needed to study prospectively the characteristics of, of these people, their, their age, um, characteristics of, of their cancer, what types of cancers they have, and, you know, really look, do a deep dive and look about the genomic drivers driving their cancers. So we started this protocol, Genomics of Young Lung Cancer, similar to the epidemiology of young, lung, young lung cancer. And, you know, uh, we also had to do some creative thinking about how we would find these people because it is rare, you know, probably less than two or one percent of all lung cancers are on people uh, less than age 40 where we set the bar. So we decided that we'd have a website, the World Wide Web, uh, so patients didn't have to walk into actual brick and mortar cancer clinic to be able to, to consent to this trial. And, you know, this concept that Bonnie Adario herself bringing research to patients um, and with the help of patient groups and the World Wide Web, um, we were able to accrue 103, 133 patients on, on this trial. And, and it showed that, again, they tended to be women. The, the median age was about 34. Uh, the vast majority, over 80, like 85% were adenocarcinomas. Uh, they tend to be never smokers, and over 80% of them had a driver mutation, which is very different from the general population of lung cancer, or about 30, 35%, so more than double. And, you know, our goal was to set the stage for future trials to, to look at environmental and epidemiologic causes. And, you know, I think we were successful on, on two, two parts, going back to Jill, she wanted to be an ambassador of awareness. And, you know, I, I think she fulfilled that. I mean, she did pass away at age 22 uh, several years ago, but, you know, she was an ambassador of, of awareness. She brought, brought this to our attention and, and to the world. And also through genomics of young lung cancer, we have set the stage for, for epidemiology of, of young ca lung cancer. So it was very, very successful. Yeah, I think um, you brought up Bonnie, and for those of you who know her, you know she's a um, she's a force to be reckoned with. And um, the situation that happened with Jill that Dr. Gitlitz was talking about was um, was really sort of this eye opener um, for her and others, obviously, um, about you know what is happening here. And and I think. Um, one of the things that Bonnie did, Jill had a, a best friend and the, a woman that was in her sorority who decided in order to raise awareness for lung cancer, she was going to run from New York to San Francisco. And so Bonnie got on the horn and was, you know, trying to get some press around this, like, hey, let's make some noise. And people were saying, well, where's the data on young lung cancer? Like, who, who's, who's looking at it? And the sort of short answer was no one, right? And so, again, everyone knowing Bonnie, the, the way that they do, no one wasn't a, wasn't a, a great answer. So um, this, this study was put together in, in fairly short order, as Dr. Gitlet said, and, and the foundation played a, a and, and other foundations played a big role in doing some of that outreach. And it just goes to show you that, um, you know, with some of these more innovative ideas, you can really get some of these things done quickly. Dr. Gitlitz, can you talk a little, you mentioned the remote consenting. Can you talk a little bit about how that might be different from the way a traditional consenting is done in this sort of study or trial? Sure. I just want to mention one other thing about Bonnie. You know, at that time, she was, you know, really a real proponent that not all lung cancer is the same, that there are multiple slices of this big pie that we call lung cancer, you know, and, and she was determined, you know, to like, identify different slices of that pie. And, you know, that, that goes on to today where we're still looking for new driver mutations, new, new biomarkers, new ways that we can, you know, treat patients. So, you know, very forward thinking. Um, so remote consent before I forget. So yes, we set <laughs> up <laughs> we set up a website uh, through the U, you know uh, through the USCIRB and uh, through the Adario Lung Cancer Foundation where uh, people you know patients can drive other patients uh, to this website and uh, there was a, a short questionnaire to see if you qualified. Pretty much you know are you less than were you less than age forty when you were diagnosed with lung cancer. You know, do you have non-small cell lung cancer? You know, if so, you know, contact this number. And we had a project manager, and she could send them consent forms, and everything could be done online. 
um, the, the, uh, the Lung Cancer Foundation thought of everything we were able to remotely collect blood and specimens and store them and route them, route them, you know, it was, it was a, uh, you know, a very smooth running uh, machine, really amazing for, for what, it, what, for that time. Um, and, and now there are many uh, different patient groups on social media uh, that, that share research and contribute to research. So, you know, this was 2014 and now we're in 2021 and we all know how social media uh, can, can influence and, and move, move things forward. I think it's that's true, one of the most problems of social media. I, I agree. And I think it, you know, it's a, again, this sort of innovative way of sort of thinking outside of the box in order to make studies like this easily accessible um, to the subset of the population, really sort of set a precedence because we're seeing things like this happen more and more. So, um, I mean, um, yeah, it's all. Sorry to overtalk, you know, we recruited people from all over the world, all over the United States, all over Europe, Middle East. Australia, you know, it, it was really, really quite amazing, you know, what we were, yeah. what we were able to, what we were able to accomplish. There, d d Bonnie likes to tell the story, and so I'll share it really quickly before, um, before we sort of move into the, the second piece of this about um, some of those blood draws and and making it easy for patients. Uh, one of the young patients who participated um, early on in genomics of young lung was from Australia, and she was having trouble getting her blood drawn there. So she and her husband and children were planning a vacation anyway, and they decided to come out to San Francisco, and uh, we worked to get a phlebotomist sent out to their hotel so we could get the blood draw for her, and it it all sort of worked out. And so um, there, are, there, are, there are many ways um, to get things done, and um, I'm so proud of the, the team that worked together to uh, to do this so that we could gather this information um, that has brought us to kind of where we are today and sort of the next step in this. And so, um, and this is a, a question for both Dr. Nieva and Dr. Gitlitz, but based on these findings from the genomics of, of young lung cancer study, um, what has sort of happened since then? And, you know, how did that, how did that study support the need for further studies um, in this subset, um, and what does that have to do with uh, what we're going to be talking about today? Well, you know, I think the first thing that happened is we realized how little we know. Um, you, you know, lung cancer is interesting as compared to a lot of other cancers. If you look at a lot of other tumors, when they affect people that are young, very frequently those patients will have been born with some mutation that led to a predisposition for cancer. So uh, you hear about genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 or, or genes like um, MEN1 or 2, things that people are born with these abnormalities, they're passed on from parent to child. But none of that happens in lung cancer, or at least doesn't happen, you know, very commonly at all. The mutations that Barbara and her team uh, identified were not mutations that people can be born with. All these mutations that she found are lethal uh, in, at the embryo development stage. So we found that, yes, these, these patients that have lung cancer are young, they frequently have EGFR mutations and ALK mutations, and they weren't born with any of them. So the question is, how do you get them? Where does that come from? Uh, why is it that one person gets it and not another? And, th and that really brought to bear the need for an epidemiology study, a study that looked at what is the relationship between this disease, the abnormalities in the tumor that we identified, and, and all the various genes that, that uh, Barbara found in her study, and, and what does that mean for um, you know, causes because it's it's not tobacco. That that much we that you know we know that much. It's something that's not tobacco. Uh, it's not fried food. It's not you know it's it's not that these people are heavy. You know, there's something else. And so we really need to start thinking and asking a lot of questions about why is this phenomenon happening, and particularly in women, why is it increasing? because we are seeing more young women, particularly women who live in wealthier countries, 
uh, being diagnosed with lung cancer at earlier ages. So, sorry, I'm just taking some some notes here because I want to make sure um, to come back to something that you said. So, so what you're saying, I just want to make sure that the community watching right now understands what we're looking at in a study, um, an epidemiology study, is not necessarily um, anything cl clinically related or health related. As you said, you know, it's not something somebody was born with. It didn't come from some of the known sort of causes of such a disease, but something else. So um, what type of information are we seeking to gather? You touched on a couple of things, but, you know, if we could dive a little bit deeper, because I know I get, let me step back again. I get this question a lot, and the Helpline team here at GoTo gets this question a lot. People want to know why, how, why, why did I get lung cancer? How did I get lung cancer? And it's not just lung cancer. I think, you know, with any diagnosis, people are looking for a reason. And so this type of a study is to, to, to help to sort of further identify and button down commonalities that might point to such a thing as, as a reason or a cause, correct? Exactly. So the, the first thing we do is we recognize that lung cancer is not one disease. Uh, so we're going to separately analyze the EGFR patients from the ALK patients, from the KRAS patients. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we got that insight from, from Barbara's data that, you know, lung cancer is not one disease. Every one of these subtypes needs to be looked at separately. And then we're going to ask a lot of questions. Um, and so for the people who've enrolled in this study, God bless you all. Uh, because the survey that we ask you to complete is long and detailed. And it's going to ask you things about where you live, what other problems you have, what kind of jobs have you had, what, what have you worked with in your jobs, what's your birth order. There's a survey for your birth mother to complete. Um, you know, what's your diet? What do you do with about physical activity, alcohol, smoking, reproductive and menstrual history? Um, all these things get asked about in detail, and then we're going to have some very smart epidemiologists, some very smart statisticians take all that data from all the participants and crunch them together. And then we're going to ask, what's different about these people? What, it, what are the unique features? And if I knew what the unique feature was, I wouldn't have to ask. Um, but we think that we're going to find something that tells us, oh, you know, perhaps we're going to find out that, you know, everybody with a Ross one mutated cancer always had a first floor bedroom. Literally, this is the, the level of detail that that we're asking about. Um, so, so we don't know what we're going to find. Uh, it's a very broad survey. Um, and we're hoping that we're going to find something useful and something that's going to tell us a little bit about the biology of all these separate forms of lung cancer. So I might add, to speak to their moms. I mean, there's even a survey for their birth mom if if they, you know, if they're around and, and willing to fill it out. So, <laughs> find so out I, all. I, I'm curious about that question too, and that was going to be one of my follow-on questions. Why the birth mother? Um, is it something about her particular history, or is it just that she's more likely to know what her child did growing up than, we're, than anyone we're, else. We're going to ask questions about uh, in utero exposures and things like that. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating. This type of study is, is fascinating to me. And I think one of the things that makes it so cool is it's, um, it's something that people can do f from anywhere, right? You don't need to um, go to your, 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 your health center or to, to, to a doctor's office or a clinic um, to participate in this. So, um, it really does sort of open those doors and allow people to uh, to be a part of the the solution. So, who um, who qualifies for? Uh, before I ask for who qualifies for this, because I think it's the same as who qualified for genomics of young lung. Um, Barbara, how did we come up with forty as a cutoff, or why? You know, this is. It's it's the adolescent and young lung the the, the uh, ad, adolescent and young adult sorry you know definition uh, less than forty yeah. you know as you get older um, more and more things will confound that you know more 
it, more exposures. The older you are, the more you've moved around, different exposures. Um, unfortunately, the older that we get, we take on more mutations. So it, it's just not as uh, it's just not as pure, if, if you will, as studying a, a younger population. Um, you know, we have this amazing opportunity. It's like, would you rather find a needle in a haystack or would you rather find a needle in a half a bale of hay? I don't know, something, you know, much yeah. more small, you know, to be able to yeah. examine this population that's so enriched for these oncogenic drivers versus just the general population of lung cancer. You know, you have such a higher chance of, of finding something and studying less people. So this is just such an amazing, you know, opportunity that that we have, and you know, we're so grateful for Stephen and for every every person that you know dives into that that questionnaire. Yeah, that's great. Um, so now let's get into sort of some of the the nitty gritty about who qualifies. We know it's this um, under forty uh, population, but Dr. Nieva, can you talk a little bit about some of the other um, must haves or must dos to qualify for this study? So you you must live in the United States, and that's that's something that um, was something we just couldn't get around, uh, just from a logistic standpoint. Um, and then you do have to have had comprehensive biomarker testing, and it doesn't matter what the result was; you just have to have had it, um, and you have to be under forty. And then you, and then you have to have a big enough heart to complete the survey. Um, that's the other uh, thing that we ask of you. Can you talk a little bit just for some of those who are watching who might not know what comprehensive biomarker testing is? Can you explain um, that to the folks watching? Of course. So comprehensive biomarker testing means that you've had some attempt to understand what is the driver of your cancer. And most of that nowadays is best done through a technique called next generation sequencing or whole transcriptome sequencing. These are techniques that look at the DNA inside the tumor itself and look to see what was the change in the DNA that started this cancer. And so was it a mutation in EGFR? Was it a mutation in ALK? Was it ROS1? Was it KRAS? Um, you should, at minimum, in the United States, have testing for at least nine genes. Um, and that is that is the bare minimum. And unfortunately, most people in the United States don't even get that. The, the incidence of good testing is too low. And, and I'm really thankful that the GoTo Foundation makes that message one of their main messages, that people with lung cancer need to have good testing done. Um, but for the majority of um, patients seen now in an academic medical center like USC or UCLA or another large center, they'll have next generation sequencing done. So they'll have over 400 genes looked at uh, and will really have a very good understanding of what was driving the cancer. You, you need to have had good testing done and in order to participate in the study because we want to make sure that we have you categorized into the correct group. Yeah, thank you. I think I think it's important that people, that folks understand um, that for two reasons. One, to know whether or not they qualify for the study, but two, to your point, that if they haven't had this testing done, um, that it's a conversation they need to uh, have with their doctors about, um, you know, getting access to, to this type of um, of diagnostics because it is so so very important. Um, one of the things you talked about is it being U.S. only study, and I know it's a, that's a little bit different than the way we ran genomics of young lung cancer, and that that was a worldwide study. Can you talk about? Because I, I know we're gonna we've got folks that are watching that maybe did participate in the genomics study and are wanting to know why they can't participate in this. Talk a little bit about. Um, I don't. I don't want to call it clean data, but you know what what happens here in the United States might not be what is happening in in Australia, and like you know demographics or, or geography are a, a, a good example of that. Right, and and it's exactly that. It's it's when you when you talk to the epidemiologists, the the people who do this type of stuff all the time. There's 
um, there's a lot of variability um, in soil conditions, in food content, in understanding of, of languages and other practice habits and exposures. And the, the science of epidemiology is such that the population needs to be somewhat narrowed. Um, and, you know, if, if we could have done this study and only done it in, um, you know, a 10 square mile area in Los Angeles, we, we would have the cleanest data um, because then everything would be controlled for a very small group. And so yeah. um, we had to basically draw the line somewhere in terms of limiting the population while at the same time making sure that we have enough patients to be able to get the data we need. Um, and so for that reason, the, the study is going to be limited to, to the United States. Yeah, Great. like to, you know, like the epidemiologists can like look mm -hmm. up zip codes where they were born, you know, were they close to a nuclear plant, a nuclear power plant, were they, you know, close to a, a factory farm, you know, so it, it's much easier to do as, as Jorge said, you know, in, in one, in one place in, in the United States. And, That's and great. Thank you. That, both. Oh, go ahead. And, and it's, you know, those other databases that exist for the United States that may not exist in other countries that need to be integrated as well. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. I just, I didn't want people to think that we weren't being inclusive and let them know that there was, there was, you know, rhyme and reason to, um, to making that one of the uh, qualifying criteria. So you did mention um, the blood drop. Can you explain a little bit about the purpose of the blood draw um, that, you know, to go up ahead and, and coincide with some of this uh, data that we'll be collecting through the surveys? Of course. Well, we are collecting blood so that the best DNA and genetic and scientific laboratories out there in the U.S. can use the newest technologies to find disease associations. So one of the things that, that happens when, when people have their, their tumor DNA analyzed, they, they ask, well, does it analyze all the genes in the cancer? And, and the answer is no. It, it doesn't analyze all the genes in, uh, in the cancer. It, it analyzes a subset of the genes that are known to be associated. Um, but that's just a small percentage of all the DNA that's in the body and in the cells. And so we want to look at all of it. And we want to have laboratories in academic centers that are using the latest techniques, not just looking at the DNA sequence itself, uh, which of course is very important, but also the, the patterns that in which genes are turned on and off. Because, you know, here we are in the year 2021, we're actually pretty good at, at looking at, at all the genes that we know about, all the genes that make proteins in our bodies. And we've had those looked at for a long time. And, and we've not, you know, we've not found familial causes of young lung cancer, for example. Um, and so what we really want to look at are not the genes that make the proteins, but the, the DNA sequences around proteins. Because as you know, um, most of our DNA doesn't actually code for a, a protein, doesn't code for a gene. It just gives signals as to which gene to look at. Uh, and so we want to look at those areas as well, those areas um, that are non-coding DNA regions. So we want to look at how DNA gets modified over the course of a lifespan um, using this, this chemical technique that our body uses called methylation that turns some genes on and some genes off and, and does that kind of regulation. When you start looking at it, the amount of data that's generated from a single patient specimen is enormous. And, and it takes very sophisticated analyses to look at so sophisticated that we're not going to have just one person do it um, but when we collect these blood samples we're gonna take them divide them up into specific volumes and then we have several different um, laboratories 
they're going to look at it using their own techniques, using the latest things out there, so that if there is something to find, we're going to have lots of opportunities to find associations. And this is a, because I'm just, I'm trying to sort of jump ahead and guess about some questions we might get afterwards. So I'm trying to ask them now to kind of cut them off at the pass. This is a single blood draw, correct? Yes. And for a person who um, maybe is not all that keen on, you know, going out for an extra um, appointment, even if it is just for a blood draw, is this something that can be tacked on to an already scheduled draw? In other words, if they're already going in for blood work to have an extra vial or two or however many you need taken at the same time. Absolutely. And, and you know, we've even arranged uh, for uh, phlebotomy services to be able to come to people's home as well, uh, to, to have it done without having to go to another place. Or, you know, you can go to a lab place if that would be more convenient for you. We want to make this as easy as possible. Um, because we we know that um, we know that what the participants give us is a gift. It's a gift of their time. It's a gift of their blood, literally. Um, and and we want to be as respectful of that uh, as we can and make it as easy as possible while still doing the best science we can do. I love that. I love that you said that. And I also love that it's an opportunity for the oh so many folks I talk to who have been diagnosed to give back in some way, because I do get that question a lot, like how how can I give back um, to this community to help further research? And I think that's a perfect segue into Stephen. You know, here we're talking about all sort of the ins and outs and what is an epidemiology study? You know, how do you participate? But you're the you're the guy who's who's been there and done it. So can you talk a little bit um, about your experience in participating in the study? Yeah, I'd love to. I, I you know, I'd like to preface it with um, I, I, I'd like to highlight the importance of the study as 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 you guys have so eloquently uh, outlined earlier in the discussion. It's you know, when you look at young lung cancer, I look at it as a totally different or you know separate disease because, in my opinion, young adults, um, you know, we're just at such a different point in our life uh, than sometimes maybe uh, the general, uh, general, generally statistically diagnosed. And what I mean by that is, um, I think about the age. You know, I, I was not far too far removed uh, from my parents' insurance. I was on my own insurance. I was starting my my new career path. Uh, I was beginning my marriage, and so uh, you know, dealing with some of these um, some of these issues can be can be so taxing and, and can be so difficult. And uh, to to know that there is is a study like the epidemiology study that is solely focused on uh, patients like myself. It is so refreshing. It gives me so much hope, and uh, it, it really does motivate me um, to advocate to try and recruit uh, other patients to enroll. Because, as we all know, the more information we have, the smarter we are, and, and the and the better results that we can yield. So, um, as far as the study itself, uh, it's so easy. You know, Dr. Nieva joked about the the survey and. And uh, yes, it is. It's 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 long and it's very detailed. And, and you may not remember all the answers. You may not necessarily uh, be able to. But do your best. You know, I'm a teacher. And so I'm used to just saying, hey, do your best. Try to try to remember what you can and just keep moving forward, because I think it's so important to know how how essential this study is and how essential it is uh, to know why young people are being diagnosed with with lung cancer. Um, we ask that question all the time. Why, why, why? Is it environment? Is it lifestyle? Is it uh, genetic risk factors? And so as a patient, we know that there's power in information. And so the more that we can do um, to, to you know, yield that information and give that and put that in the hands of, of the right researchers, we can really make an impact. And so if it means filling out a questionnaire, 
sign me up. I'll do as many as I can. If it means doing a, a, a blood draw, let me know where to go. I'll, I'll be there, you know, in 10 minutes. And so uh, the eagerness that I am seeing from my fellow young lung cancer patients is great. Uh, but as we know with anything, we don't need to settle. We need to keep pushing. We need to be ambassadors uh, for this for this tremendous study. And so um, I think that's why we're all here. And that's and that's our part as as patients. That's what we can do um, to help push the needle forward. Stephen, did think, your mom think, send off the birth mother? Uh, <laughs> she yet? was she. Yeah, she was more than happy. My mother is a, uh, it, she actually works in cancer research, not lung cancer, um, but she works in cancer research. And so she was, she was more than happy to help uh, and, and help in any way that she could. And she's actually helping to recruit other mothers of other cancer patients. <laughs> how, how long did it take you to fill out the survey? And can you talk about like the pacing that you were allowed to do it in, the timing? Yeah. Sure. I think, you know, everyone is so different. I think uh, it depends on how, how uh, meticulous you are and how detail you, you know, detail oriented you can be as a person. I, I know someone that, that completed the survey in, in 45 minutes, I think is, is what someone told me they did it. It took me a, about an hour and a half to, to two hours. Um, I work mm -hmm. pretty quick. I think everyone is different. And so um, it's, you know, yeah, I guess that's the best answer I got. <laughs> and I think um, there is a two week window, right? From the time you start the survey to the time you complete it. So you can, to your point, Dr. Gitlitz, Gitlitz um, pace yourself um, if you aren't that one who's just like a sit down, get it done, you know, type of man or woman, you can just sort of set aside 15 or, you know, 20 minutes a day um, and kind of plug away at it and, and, and come back. Absolutely. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice perk to this study too. I'm curious um, if, you know, depending upon what we ultimately find from this study, um, if, if, if this study or, and or studies like it have the potential to sort of make movement in other areas, whether it's other cancers or studies that will follow on from something like this. What does what does this typically look like when the results sort of do finally come in, particularly if they show some of these commonalities that we were talking about earlier? Well, I think we're certainly going to want to do follow up um, surveys depending on what we find. So those follow ups will be much better targeted um, if yeah. we find something. So let's imagine that we find that, you know, uh, everybody who has an EGFR mutated cancer, um, you know, mother gave them, you know, carrots at a young age. Well, then we'll, we'll be, you know, doing a lot of analysis of, of what's in carrots and what kind of DNA uh, happens there. And then we're going to do a follow on survey of, you know, regions that have you know, carrot farming and regions that don't. And, 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 and I, I say that, um, you know, as, as, as something that, you know, is probably not what we're going to find, but, but let's say we did that, that those would be the, the natural next questions that would come about where we would try to confirm the associations and, and continue to do follow on science um, to try to understand why is this happening? And then also then what, is there something different we can do about it? You know, let's say in this blood draw, for example, we find that the the thing that uh, all these people with EGFR mutated lung cancer have in common is a particular DNA sequence um, that's not in EGFR, but is somewhere else, but but actually drove the development of the mutation. Well, then you can imagine that we could then do a follow up study where we screen large populations for the presence of that DNA sequence uh, or know that, okay, well, that DNA sequence is present in, you know, this country much more than it is in that country. Uh, so should we, should we do differential screening, for example? Would we do then low-dose CT scans in people who have the DNA sequence that we identified? You know, one can imagine a lot of follow-up questions that you would ask, and that's the nature of science, right? That, you know, you, 
whenever you answer a question, you immediately ask a dozen more. And so we, we never really finish. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that we're going to finish this study and say, aha, it's settled. This is what happened. Um, we're we're going to do this study and say, okay, now what, let's move on to the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the ultimate would be, you know, to find something that you can screen for or find something that you can prevent. You know, that that would be the ultimate. You know, are we going to get that answer right away from this trial? Who knows? It, but like like Jorge said, we, we probably need follow on trials. Yeah, I think that's great. It's this this type of study yeah. is absolutely fascinating to me. The, the things you can find and I know. Um, you know, you were using the carrot analogy, but I mean, who knows, you know, if not a carrot, maybe it's a beet or, you know, uh, you know, it could be, it could be anything, the type of paint in your house. Like, I just think it's, it's absolutely right. fascinating, um, th this type of study. Um, we just got a little note from Michelle, a lot of you watching, and of course, those of you um, participating in the panel today know Michelle, she is the uh, spearheader of this living room program. And she just let us know that there are three people online watching uh, right now who signed up for the study this morning and two folks yeah. who uh, hadn't signed up yet, but now that they've been watching this program are uh, look, looking into it. So with that, I kind of want to go into, I want to be mindful of time. I want to go into a little bit about um, how to how how to participate and how to recruit and I think you all heard you know Stephen give sort of his PSA announcement for it and um, I think that's amazing and what better way um, to to engage and encourage folks to participate than by word of mouth from someone who's done it so if you are watching and you have uh, participated or currently in the process of enrollment, and I think there's about 64 folks out there right now in the process of enrollment, I encourage you to share this. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Nieva and Dr. Gitlitz talked a little bit earlier about some of these subgroups from a, a biomarker status, whether it's the EGFR group or the OUT group or the ROS1 group, uh, KRAS kickers and, and, and others. Um, this is also a subset, right? This young lung cancer population and, and knowing and being able to work with a lot of you over the years, I know you all know one another. So spread the word um, loud and, and spread it proud. The, the, the more quickly we can get the study enrolled, the more quickly we can get um, all the important information that you're so generously giving us um, looked at, um, uh, at, researched, and hopefully we'll be able to find some really amazing things. So um, I know it's come up on the screen a couple of times here how to participate um, in its, uh, as I mentioned, the Dario Lung Cancer Medical Institute, our, our medical institute. The website is alcmi.net backslash research backslash E-O-Y-L-C, um, or of course you can uh, call. Uh, we've got some lovely folks, Allison and others on the on the end of the line, ready and willing and able to answer any of your questions. And that phone number is 888-443-6952 or 888-44-E-O-Y-L-C. So please, please, please um, check it out. Um, if you go to the website, there's a really quick little you know questionnaire you can take qualifying qu questionnaire that you can take to see if you qualify and uh, and participate and if you do participate please uh, feel free to reach out to myself or or anyone else here at go to and let us know about your experience because we always love that feedback um, from everyone um, with that I'm going to ask for any final thoughts um, from the panelists anything you want to close out um, in saying about this or anything really um, uh, as it pertains to, to lung cancer, and then I'll jump into the housekeeping. I think we, I we've stated to... it all. Oh, go ahead, Jorge. I, I was just gonna once again, thank our participants, uh, thank the GoTo Foundation for getting the word out uh, oh. and for sponsoring this type of research, uh, and thank everyone who really is out there being an advocate for not just, um, not just for research, but for other patients and, and making sure that everyone out there with lung cancer is getting the best treatment they can. Yeah, I, I share those sentiments. And, you know, again, the, the, how this is uh, decreasing any stigma over lung cancer. You know, we know that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. And, 
you know, we we just have to to do do to do this research and and find better better cures and better better ways to treat people and and find them and screen them. Um, so just very grateful um, for this trial and for all the participants and their time. Thanks, Barbara. Stephen. Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Gitlitz and Dr. Niema and Danielle again for for having us on today and the Go To Foundation. Um, like Doc, Dr. Nieva mentioned, for, for putting on this incredible research. You know, it's never easy to hear the, those words, you have cancer. And I think, you know, for me, I can only speak about my journey, but it was really difficult to hear that um, at, at that age, you know, of 29 years old, because I was supposed to be enjoying the benefit of, of youth, right, and good health. And and so I think it, it, it's sometimes it's easy um, for people on the outside to look at young adults with cancer and say, well, you know, they're full of energy and they can, they can just, you know, bounce right through this. But uh, we face numerous challenges. You know, I mentioned this a minute ago, whether it's insurance, whether it's um, cost of care, fertility. I know that for myself personally, my wife and I are so blessed to have great insurance and, uh, we're, we're the benefactors of that in, in regards to helping bring our son into this world, uh, mm -hmm. but others aren't. And, and fertility is a big thing for, for young lung cancer patients. And so the fact that this study is going to hopefully just collect data that can increase more knowledge, more information, and, and hopefully increase positive outcomes uh, for young lung cancer patients, I am just so grateful. And I, I, I thank you, I commend you for all that you're doing. And I am happy to recruit. If anyone has questions, please, if you're a lung can young lung cancer patient, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so very, very appreciated um, everything you just said and all you do for uh, GoTo Foundation, for the lung cancer community, for the young lung, lung cancer patients out there, I just, I cannot thank you enough. And to doctors uh, Neva and Gitlitz, I can't thank either of you enough for all the work that you are doing to help um, bring all of this great research to the surface and, and, and to light and for participating today. And I echo the sentiment of all of those who participate in studies, this one and others. I mean, we, we simply cannot learn and move forward and do better without uh, your participation in, in, in clinical trials and, and studies such as this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am gonna finish up with um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, as those of you know, and Stephen knows intimately, uh, and maybe some of you don't know, but Bonnie has written a book. Um, it is called The Living Room, A Lung Cancer Community of Courage. Um, it's currently available for pre-sale, and I know for the past several months, I've been announcing a book launch date of May 4th, um, but you know, due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, somewhat COVID related in, in delays, um, it will be May 18th. And I don't mean that Bonnie has COVID, I mean printing delays due to backlogs of, of, uh, of projects. So it'll be May 18th now. The, so be on the lookout for that to come live and for us to be talking about it a little bit more intimately um, here at the living room, but you can do your pre-order right now on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, or of course on our website at gotofoundation.org. Um, um, our regular programming living room will um, be May 18th. We have, and we will be talking about, about the book. We're going to give you guys a sneak peek because that is launch day. Dr. Posse Yane from Dana-Farber um, will be here along with survivors Hank Basket, Jim Pantelis, uh, and Gina Hollebeck to uh, talk about and give a sneak peek into what you can expect uh, when you get at, at your very own copy. So be sure to tune in for, for that one. Um, our registration is now open for our second annual Summer Jam Virtual 5K Your Way, which is on June 26th. Um, I know some of you watching may have participated last year. It was our first sort of leap into doing uh, this virtual event. It was a national event. It was wildly successful and insanely fun. So please consider signing up or at least go take a look on our website at summerjam5k.org to see what it's all about. It's very, uh, it's a very fun day. Um, and if you're more of an endurance athlete and you want to check out our My Perfect Marathon program, you can do that at uh, myperfectmarathon.org as well. 
Um, another way you can contribute data is through our lung cancer registry. So please consider doing that. That is open to all comers, not just the young, young lung cancer patients that we were talking about today. Um, and then finally, I want to rethank um, all of you on the panel, those of you watching live, those of you who will come back and watch post live. Um, we, you are who we do this for. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, for tuning in today. Peninsula Television, of course, who is on the back end of, um, of this programming, uh, helping us to bring it to you live. Um, our supporters, whom we could not do this without, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bristol, Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your support and recognizing um, the value that this type of information from key opinion leaders such as Dr. Nieva and Dr. Gitlitz can bring to our community. Um, with that, um, I bid you all a wonderful rest of your day and I will uh, hopefully see you on May 18th. Thanks everybody. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see